House of the Lord today. Amen. Awesome. Okay, I wanted just to uh, highlight a few things in your bulletin if you want to get those out really quickly. Uh, next Sunday, we are going to take back this so called holiday from the enemy and say, you know what? We're going to do something special around the church and we're going to call it Trunk or Treat. So uh, we need candy with that highlighted on the top. Did you see that? <laughs> church, you've responded well. We have a ton of candy. Um, a lot of the businesses have given us candy. We need more. We're hoping to see about four or 500 people from our community come join us, and we'd like to give them candy. And so <laughs> uh, if you can do that by Thursday morning, that'd be great. We also need some parking attendants. Uh, Norm Springer is going to be heading that up, so if you want to come and see him, you have time on Sunday, uh, go see him, as well as four more cars to decorate. If you're like... Yeah, I don't want Dave to come over and bug me about it, so I'm just going to sign up, uh, do that. Otherwise, I may tackle you before a uh, service, so um, just be aware of that. We need four more cars. That happens next Sunday, 5 to 8 p.m., and we're, we also have a hamburger dinner. Hello, right? So come on over at 4.30. Uh, the social team's going to cook up uh, a hamburger dinner for us. So it sounds like a great evening. Love for you guys to be a part of that. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, we're going to have a kids' night out next Wednesday. Uh, it's going to be a hoot, 6 o'clock in the gym. It's going to be all gym stuff. And so if you're a first grader through fifth, parents, we'd love to have you back there. Uh, Jacob Mills has been calling all the parents. Can you believe that? Just went through the whole list. So hopefully you got a phone call. And if not, you'll get one this week. 6 o'clock, there's going to be food, and it's going to be a fun time. I uh, just want to, again, make you aware of that. Uh, so that's all I have for us today. Um, I wanted to mention uh, you have a giving envelope. Uh, we're not passing around offerings still, but you certainly can drop those into the basket in the, in the back or in one of our offering boxes at the end of service. Can we just pray for that offering? Pray for today. Let's get our hearts focused as we continue in worship. Lord God, how good it is to come together as a group of believers. Father God, you have made us, you know each one of us, and so Father, we come to you with all kinds of needs, Lord, we come to you with all kinds of things that we're holding on to, we pray that even right now, you'll just take those burdens from us, Lord God, as you've promised, Lord, we'll lay them at your feet, Father, you are worthy of us to do that, so Father, we do that right now, we worship the God, the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Lord, we were reminded of those who are serving us abroad, and even in our own community, Lord. We lift them up. Thank you for them and their service to us, Lord. And Father, we'd be remiss if we do not pray for them, continue to give willingly, Lord God, sacrificially, Lord, to their cause. And reminded of those in Haiti, Lord, who are still abducted and in fear of their lives, families, Lord, and missionaries. Lord, I just pray over that many others. So, Father, just uh, we give you our sacrifices and pray this today. Amen. Uh, you also have a prayer card in there, folks. Feel free to fill those out as the band is playing. Maybe you have a prayer concern, uh, a praise. Put that on your card today, and we'll make sure we pray about it tomorrow. Thank you, folks.
his body lay a light of the world by darkness slain and bursting kids are in here that need to leave, I guess, fourth, fifth grade, and youth, and all those folks, they can take off. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and open it in the Old Testament to the book of Nehemiah. We're starting a, a new series. We just finished a series on doubt. If you've been following along, it, it kind of goes in, a, in a, a somewhat coherent line that we started back in January about the process of following the Lord and the things that occur and the way they occur in our life and as a church. And we got through that, that area of, of doubt. And as we get to, to the end of doubt, it, we come to the story of God's people in the Old Testament where they come to a place of repentance and uh, joy, a newfound joy in the Lord. And that's what we find in the book of Nehemiah. And so it's all about uh, that, that sense of uh, giving God the worship that he deserves and consistently uh, opening our hearts uh, to hear his word to us. And that would be his word, the Bible, today. And so um, as we start into that series, uh, let me uh, have you stand and we'll look at Nehemiah chapter 8. I don't know if it's on the screen or not. Oh, it's kind of small, but if you've got it on your device, you can follow along. I'll read it to you and, and you can follow with me. Uh, we'll read uh, 8 1 through about 8 8, I think. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly. Both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until early midday. In the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra, the scribe, stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand. And Padiah, Mishael, Malchiah, Hashem, Hashbadan, Zechariah, and Meshulam, excuse me, on his left hand. Wow. Well, you know, you just say it with confidence is what my seminary prep said. Nobody knows. <laughs> okay. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And he opened it, and all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads, and they worshiped the Lord with their faces on the ground. Also, Jeshua... Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Achab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalida, no, that's not right, my eyes are bad, Kalida, yeah, Azariah, Josbad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites. Couldn't he have just said, and the Levites? That's really who he's talking about there. They helped the people to understand the law while the people 
remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Father, speak to us through your word. Help us to be able to gravitate toward the truths in it, that we might rejoice. And as a people, for some of us, uh, the idea of our doubt brings us to a point of having to repent and once again trust you for all the good things. And so as we read through that today and, and look at this scripture, would you please uh, place that in our hearts, that we should be filled with great joy in worshiping you. We love you and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Um, we're looking at, at, a, at this topic, uh, again, in this sort of a telescopic look. And, and one of the things that we know after doubt is that when we have doubts, it brings about a lot of guilt. It brings about a lot of uh, difficulty sometimes in our spiritual life. And so Consequently, when we have doubt, we come to a place where we have to say, yeah, I'm in or I'm out. I'm in or I'm out. And, and for those of us who have uh, known the Lord for a long time, uh, the doubts seem to be heavier or, or bigger. Um, and at the same time, uh, when we have doubts, uh, they're, they're maybe a little bit easier to climb out of when we've been with the Lord for a long time. And I say that because we, we've been through it before and we know what it means. Uh, for those who are new to the Lord, for those who are new believers, doubts can come quickly. Of course, the, our enemy, the devil, loves to plant doubts in our heads, and, and so consequently, we have lots of doubts. And they don't have to be huge doubts, but they're enough to knock us off track. I remember when I used to work in camps with, with kids, we could count on, you know, the same churches would come to camp every year. And some of the kids would come, you know, through junior high, they would come at, you know, sixth grade through eighth or ninth grade, and and every summer you could almost, you, you knew which kids were going to come forward at the end of the week. Because they had come forward every year at the end of the week, right? And you think as a mature Christian, I don't need to do that as often. Maybe in a smaller way. But this was like a life-changing, emotional event for these junior hires every, every year sometimes. And, and you know, the, the repentance was, they hadn't, you know... Uh, worked for the mafia during the, during the preceding year. They hadn't committed any capital crimes. But in their mind, they had strayed. They had gone far afield from what God wanted for them. So, so we, we realize that for younger believers, it's a little bit more difficult. For, for older believers, it's, it's maybe not as difficult to climb up. But sometimes the doubts don't creep in unless they're really significant doubts for an older believer. And that's That's tough. And so as we get to that place, it's, it's, it's an all-in or all-out sort of perspective for us that, that love the Lord. We're either in or we're out. And so um, we know the story of Nehemiah, maybe the, the story of Ezra. If you've been around the church for a long time, you've heard these stories. But, but Israel had been taken into captivity. They were once a very prosperous people things are going well for them as i've shared with you before in in sort of a, a picture form you know they they have this great relationship with god and then they drift away from god and they find themselves down at the bottom of that of the circle right and they're just they're as far from god as they can be and then something happens god works in their life and and as a nation they come back and that's a great illustration of the nation of israel and and for christians and it's for for us as individuals we we're man we have those mountaintop experiences and then something happens and it shakes our faith and we're down here. Maybe it's just the people we hang out with. Maybe it's the situations we find ourselves in, but we're down there. And that's where the doubts creep in. And then God does something to work in our life to bring us back to his, it, it, to bring us back into his good pleasure and his good, his good favor. And so uh, as we uh, look at the folks in the Old Testament, we can, we can still see ourselves in them because they were just like us. So Israel was this nation that was with God and, and serving the Lord and had done great things and all was well. And they got down to the place where they had just abandoned God. And they really didn't follow the Lord much anymore. So what did God use in their case, uh, in this instance? He used uh, uh, an opportunity for the enemy to come in and take Israel off into what we call exile. And they were in exile for 70 years, at least a generation or two, right? And so consequently, as a result of being in exile and having to do the things that all the Babylonians did and all the other pagan people did that had them as captive, they sort of lost track of God. Now, there was a, there's always been through Scripture that, that thin red thread of people who love the Lord. We see their story throughout Scripture. Uh, there are heroes. 
And there were some of those in the exile. They loved the Lord. They, they knew him well. Uh, they had been taught even in exile by their parents well. So they really wanted a relationship with the Lord, even though they were, they were far away, dragged off into a foreign land and, and made slaves, in essence, and prisoners. So then the story uh, is kind of where it picks up for us. Ezra and Nehemiah are very instrumental in bringing the people back. They had to approach the king and get permission, and all the paperwork had to be straightened out. You know how paperwork is. <laughs> Bureaucracy, right? But God cut right through all of that. And he brought this small group of people back to Israel, in fact, back to Jerusalem, and they began to rebuild the city. Nehemiah and Ezra are both very instrumental in that. Ezra here, uh, you see where Nehemiah has Ezra read the, the scripture because Ezra was a scribe, and that meant he knew the scriptures, and he, he, knew, he carried them with him, and he knew where they were, he knew how to uh, interpret them. And there were others like Ezra who uh, knew God and loved God and wanted to be spiritual leaders in the land. So they come back and they have this experience where they gather all of the people, and they get the people there in front of the, the water gate. The water gate was one of the gates in the city of Israel. And picture this, you've got this small group of of exiles who have come back, and they, they just finished the, the walls. Not even what we think of Israel today, but just a very small city. And as a result of the, the city being rebuilt, the walls being rebuilt, there are enemies all around, of course, who wanted to take their, their uh, kill them and you know, take their land and take all their tools and all the good things they had in the city. So we see in, in uh, chapter 7 and a little bit here in chapter 8, we see where Nehemiah says, do this thing. Get the people together. We're going to read. Put people on the, the parapets so they can watch out for the enemies. And let's uh, make sure that we read uh, a great celebration for what God has, has done here to the people. Now, most of the people had no idea about the law of God. When we say the law, they were reading the law. What they were reading was the first five books of the Old Testament, right? And they're reading through that to the people uh, in a way of, of celebration. But a great number of them, especially the younger people, had no idea what they were reading. Maybe they heard stories from grandma and grandpa or maybe their parents, but they really didn't have an, an idea of what was going on until Ezra began reading. And their response to it was to worship this great God who now they saw as working directly in their lives through Ezra's reading of the, of the law of the Old Testament, the uh, first five books there. And so what's very interesting is, to me anyway, is that uh, how things have changed in that sense. So Ezra gets up and he begins reading and he reads and he reads and he reads. There, there are other cases in the Old Testament where the scripture would be read and it would be read for hours and hours on end. And, and most people couldn't read. So the priests would read the law and be interested in, in getting the law out to the people. And so they would stand up like I'm standing here on a uh, platform, as they said, they built for Nehemiah above the people, and he opens the book of the law and he begins to read, and he would read for hours, and they would stand there and listen. And it was because of two things. One, they had a great reverence for God, but it was also because they wanted to hear, right? They, they stood, and they, I, I don't think that they just kind of did this all day long. I think they kind of creeped in. When it says they were standing, it was like one guy's head was on another guy's shoulder, I mean, they wanted to get in close. They wanted to hear. It was a crowd. And this isn't the biggest crowd we find in the Old Testament, but these are all the exiles who had gotten, gotten uh, the permission to come back and build. And so there they were listening in as Nehemiah said for hours as he read the Old Testament. So what I thought I would do today is read the first five books of the Old Testament and have you stand. <laughs> we'll get out about four o'clock. That is my, my estimation. Can you imagine? I mean, it was, it was because they had this tremendous respect for God. Now all of the things they had been taught while they were in the exile, some of them knew the old temple and the old city of Jerusalem, but many of them did not. And, and they would heard things, and so now they're back. And it is a really emotional time for them as they begin to, to read or have read to them uh, God's word. And so as a result, they're, li they're reading through or hearing this uh, through Nehemiah and through Ezra, especially in this particular case. And one of the things they're realizing is the same thing I told you. Wow, we rebelled. We rebelled. And look what God did. God used the enemy to come in and straighten us out. And they get to that place where they realize that God had been working in all that had, had taken place in all of the last 70 years. 
My theology says that that 70 years is symbolic of some sort of difficult time that maybe the church is going to go through someday. But, but for, for historical accounts, 70 years, they were with the, uh, the Babylonians and all the others who kept them captive and made them slaves. And now God had used that and he had brought them out of it to a place where they, he would work with them again. It's almost like a great big giant thank you, right, to God. It's like, oh, God, thank you that it's, that it's now. It's now. It's my generation. It's me that you're allowing to see all of these things happen to. And, and you're, you're allowing me to be a part of this. Thank you, God. And, and, w- and when we say thank you, God, uh, uh, the largest thank you to God is when we worship God. That's a, that's a great big giant thank you, God. And that's why uh, when Scripture tells us that God's going to seek worshipers who you know, worship from their hearts, that's what he's saying. He's, he's saying there's going to be people who are so grateful and thankful to God that that's going to spring forth in worship. We'll get to that in a minute. But we, but we have these people who are watching this all take place. That's the background of what's going on, the realization. So when we have doubts, one of the first things we want to do is go into a, a sense of, uh, I suppose, repentance. A sense of, gee, you know, I never should have doubted you, God. I knew you were going to take care of this, but I, I just got my eyes off the prize, right? I wasn't thinking straight. I, I knew you were going to handle this, but, but I just didn't, you know, I just didn't stick to what I knew, and I, I got afraid, or I, I had doubt. And so that's where the people of Israel are. And so they're coming back to God, not just by building the walls of the city, not just by rebuilding the temple, but they're coming back to God in terms of their heart. And they're realizing, wow, I, I really need to, to worship this God who is so loving and cares for me so much. And so they began to worship God like they had in, in days of old. And it all started with the idea of repentance and repent, repentant hearts. It caused me to think a little bit, before I get into the outline here, it caused me to think a little bit about church and worship in church. And I know some of you have been in church your whole life. And the worship you experience here, or the music, or the, the way the gospel is presented, or the God's word is taught, it, it's very familiar to you. But, but we are not necessarily the only people that worship in the world, right? And worship around the world is very, very different. And if you've not traveled much, and you don't know, it is really different. I mean, you can go to countries where they'll start worship at you know, 11 in the morning, and they don't end until 2 or 3 in the afternoon. And it might include a meal in the middle of worship. I'm for that. I don't know about you, but, you know. So anyway, we uh, start daydreaming about food. And so, and so we, we worship the way we worship. And, and we should be comfortable in our worship. We, sure, we surely shouldn't be distracted in our worship. But even in our own culture, there are different types of worship, aren't there? And we can almost make anything worship. Our job can be worship, right? Uh, our, our time with family can be a worshipful time. But what we're specifically talking about when we come together to to church to hear the word and to uh, speak to God and have God speak to us, right? As a a corporate body, that's what worship we're talking about this morning. And that's what the Israelites were were rediscovering. And and we can have that same sort of rediscovery, I think. Just we we open our eyes a little wider and and allow ourselves to to envision what what worship can truly be on a Sunday morning and, and how it can really truly impact our hearts. I remember I, I was pastoring uh, in a previous church, and uh, we had uh, somebody come, and they were going to be a guest uh, singer. They were a relative of the <clears throat> person in the church, and so they said, can you come and sing? It's our daughter, and she wants to sing during the offering. I said, well, sure. I don't care. That sounds great. She's got a good voice. Yeah, she's got a good voice. Okay, we'll have her sing. I mean, it was, you know, it was a small church, and so we didn't, our, our scruples were not really that great, and so... Uh, and so I said, sure, that'll, that'll take it five minutes. That's awesome. Less time I have to preach. And so she came, and uh, she's going to sing, and she got up to sing. And she said, oh, by the way, now she came, obviously, we discovered she came from a different kind of a background. Because she said, you know, I brought my daughter with me today, and she brought with her a, a tambourine and some flags. And she's going to be dancing before you as I sing. Well, you could almost hear the, the, the muscles tense up in our little country Baptist church, Right? I mean, it was like, what? Flags? What? No. You know, and uh, you, could just, you could just see it. So she gets up there to sing, 
And in our church, we, the one thing we were was we were pretty loose with applause. Everybody applauded everybody because, you, you know, you didn't want them to think that you didn't like you. That's, that's not Baptist of us. So we would, somebody would come and sing as a guest singer, and we'd all, yeah, that's great. Well, after she got done, and her daughter was kind of parading back and forth, d- different than our tradition, but very, it, you can find it right here in town, even in different churches. And there she was with her tambourine and her flags. And I think there was more attention on her than on, the, on her mom who was singing. But her mom finishes the last note, ta-da, you know, and, and the little girl just grabs her things and goes and sits down. Not a sound. I mean, it was just dead silent. It was hilarious. And so I get up there, I'm supposed to preach, and I'm like, well, we're, we're Baptist, aren't we? That got a little applause. The muscles starting to loosen a little bit, right? After the service was over, tons of people, you know, wrapped their arms around her and said, oh, good job, and encouraged the little girls. But it was way out of their comfort zone. But, but what we have to understand is, is worship takes on many different forms. And maybe things that we're not comfortable with are very comfortable for other people. And things that we do, people might not be comfortable with. You know, somebody from, from their background might come to our church and say something like, wow, they're, they're kind of dead, aren't they? They don't even raise their hands when they sing. What is that about? You know, and that's because they come from a different comfort zone. For us, as we get into... Uh, uh, Nehemiah here, we have to realize they, they were in a different comfort zone, right? They were willing to stand and listen to the word of the Lord being read for hours because they treasured that reading of the word of the Lord. That was their, became very quickly their comfort zone for these, for these exiles. And all of it started with the idea that they had to, to repent, that they had to get right with God. They hear the story in the law and they they want to get right with God. And so that's sort of the, the background um, there. We, you know, and, and, and I want to encourage you two things. One is uh, repentance should be a daily process for us. It's not my notes either, but it should be a daily process for you. And, and secondly, uh, worship should be something not just comfortable, but something that's, that's okay comfortable for you, but, but it should stretch you just a little bit. Just a little bit. Worship hour, something should prod you. It should be the lyric from one of the songs we sing or something that we read in God's Word, or something that the speaker says, it should, it should stretch you just a little. It should make you a little uncomfortable. Uncomfortable enough that when you leave this place, you make a, a, maybe a micro decision. It doesn't have to be a grand decision, but a micro de- you know, Just enough to make you to say, well, then I'm going to reach out a little bit more. Or I'm going to touch somebody with the gospel this week. Or I'm going to be a part of this program to reach the community. Or I'm going to be a part of that ministry in the church that that reaches somebody i it should prod you i suppose is a good word to do something right the famous author robert louis stevenson once entered in his diary um, what he considered to be an extraordinary thing he said i have been to church today and surprisingly i am not depressed (laughs) well there's a time when that was you know depending on your background you could go to a church and go wow that's worse than worse than the worst uh, G.K. Chesterton, who is a famous historian and Christian writer, uh, said at the end of his book, a book titled Orthodoxy, he said, uh, Joy, which was a small publicity of the pagan, is the gigantic secret of the Christian. In other words, th- people will promise you things out there that they never deliver on, but in Christianity, our joy is the most uh, incredible thing that can spring up in our life at all times. And that's That's sort of what worship should do. It should bring about that sense of not that uh, we're depressed, but it should prod us to do greater things for God. And that should spring out of a sense of joy. We're going to find that here in in Nehemiah. So in Nehemiah, what we have uh, here is what I think is the perfect worship service. Not because of the way they did it, but because of all those things I've just mentioned. Uh, the, the feeling comfortable but yet prodded, a uh, sense of repentance, a sense of we want to do something uh, for the kingdom of God. And so as we look there, look at the first three verses, and you will find in this, in this perfect worship gathering or perfect setting that, that our gathering should reflect this thing, and that is that we should involve the Word of God. That seems to be the most important thing here to Nehemiah. Um, he gets Ezra to find the Scriptures, to read to the people, And he says, hey, just use the word of God. In the first three verses, he says, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the gate. And they told Ezra the scribe, Bring the book of the law of Moses to the Lord. 
as he commanded Israel, those are the first five books of the New Testament, called the book of the law of Moses. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all could understand it, and they heard. And, on the day of the se- and they heard it on the day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water, from early morning until midday. At least two or three hours he was just involved in reading the word of the Lord. So we should indefinite, uh, definitely involve the word of the Lord. In the New Testament, Luke, in chapter 8, uh, it says, But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Um, hear the word of God and do it. And, and in Luke 11, he goes on to say, But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So, first of all, the, the word of God, as we read it, as we study it in Scripture, uh, in, in service, we should understand that that we are to hear it, and we're to keep it, and we're to do it. Um, we're to keep it, and we're to do it. Um, it guides our life. Second thing, you know, why do we have the Word of God so involved in our lives? Because it guides our life. It, it points us in a direction. Uh, if, if every Christian just did what they thought was right in their own eyes, we know where that leads. And so this gives us clear direction. Now, there's still there are still areas where we can differ as believers. That's not a big deal. I don't think those are the things that concern God. The big things are the things that concern God. And we want to make sure that the Word of God is involved in all of the decisions that we are, that we are making. So it guides our life. Hebrews chapter 4 says, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and in the intentions of the heart. So the Word of God is, is a weapon. It's, it's actually God's weapon. We think of it as God's way to communicate to us. It is that. It is that, no doubt. But it's also a weapon in the sense that it's fashioned to pierce our heart. Uh, is there such a thing as a friendly weapon? I don't know, but it's designed to pierce our heart so that we might know more about God, that we might use it as the guide in our life. Thirdly, it is powerful in our life. And 1 Corinthians, Paul says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, right? Folly. People outside that don't know the Lord, people that, that uh, outside your sphere of Christian influence, you know, that are maybe friends you're trying to reach, them, that's one of the toughest things to share with them is that God's word is God's word. It's so hard for people to grasp that concept. And, you know, we could spend a whole uh, study series on just how we got the Word of God and what is the Word of God and how do we use the Word of God. But the bottom line is, for those of us that love Him and trust Him already, the, the Bible, His Word, our canon of Scripture, it is um, that which is powerful in our life. It's folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Sometimes, uh, i I went to, I was sharing with people this morning, I went to two big funerals this week, um, and I, I want to just tell you, share with you, that, that when you are a person who buys into God's Word because you love Him so much, and you trust everything that it says, and His Word is put forth, it can be a real strength. It can be a real strength. Along with the testimony of others around you, along with people who minister to you that can uphold you in times of struggle, Boy, I tell you, when, when I'm going through difficult times, God's Word is where I turn. And sometimes I don't quite understand it. I'll read it, you know, and you know, there are great passages, you know, the, the 23rd Psalm or something like that, where we're, we, get it, we get the picture, right? We're walking and God's protecting us, the valley of the shadow of death, all that stuff. But then there are other parts I'll read and I just, I'm like, God, that's just not speaking to me right now. But give it an hour, you know, give it a day. And all of a sudden, God's Word begins to speak to me in a different way. And so when I'm going through very difficult times, it is, it is the power of God's Word that sometimes gets me through the difficult times. I know everybody here has faced those. And I just want to encourage you to be involved in God's Word. If you're involved in a daily way, that's even better, because it's not strange to you. But when you're going through difficult times, get involved in God's Word, because it will come back. It never, never comes back void, but it'll come back to you in your in your life. It'll be a support to you. Hopefully other things will support you too, but God's Word. God's Word. And so it's powerful in our life. We, our, our, our gatherings should always involve uh, the Word of God. One of the, one of the greatest things I, I think I, I 
enjoy in church is when I hear kids, little kids, sharing the word of God. I don't know about you, but it's just always encouraging. Yeah, you know, they come, it's cute. You know, you get them up there, and, you know, for God so loved the world, he saved us all, he thought. You know, it's, it's like they, they mess it up sometimes, you know, they're, they're nervous because it's the Christmas production or something like that. But you know what? Getting, getting kids involved and, and getting them to share the word of God, getting the word of God into them in some way by memory for that, it's awesome. And when I hear a, a, a young, trusting heart that loves Jesus, why do I love Jesus? Oh, my, my mom and my dad told me I got to love Jesus. You know, I mean, they're, they're so young, they don't even, they don't know what they don't know yet. But they just know they need to love Jesus. And they share God's word. That is so powerful to me. I, I can't hardly hold it in when I see that. That's just an awesome thing. The, probably the, the next closest thing to that is when I hear the testimony of somebody who's been in the church for a billion years, and they can barely make it up to the platform. You know, they're one foot in the grave, one on a banana peel, and they are, and they are committed. Well, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll see each other in heaven. It's okay, guys. And, and, and they get up there, they share God's word, and they say, you know, I've been around a long time, and you, and you can trust them because it looks like they've been around a long time. And you, you see their face, they look like they've been around a long time, and they go, they go this is what I trust. This is what got me through. And this is what was powerful in my life. And when all else failed, I knew I could go back to God. I could talk to God. I could read God's word. And it was a tremendous help in my life. And when somebody who's, who's got that kind of life experience says that to me, I listen. I listen. Because that means something. I mean, they're speaking truth. And that means something when I hear it. And, and their journey may not be my journey, but boy, they sure can help me in my journey when I am encouraged by them in their journey. And so it is power in our lives. And that power in our lives, it doesn't just stay bundled up in us. It moves out to, to others. And so allow God's word to speak to you. Allow God's word to uh, get, in, get, involved, get into your life in such a way that it changes you, right? And so all that to say, our gatherings should always involve God's word. I think it's significant that Nehemiah says, Grab the book of the law. Grab Moses' law. Let's get the, we got to read this. Let's get together, gang. we gotta, we got to read this. If you read back in chapter 7, the first five or six verses of chapter 7, it kind of gives you the, the roundabout way. I think that's where it's located, where he tells them how to do it. You know, he puts people up on the walls to guard the enemies. He puts others around their houses to make sure nobody's sneaking into the camp and getting into people's homes. Uh, it's just these little huts, you know, that they built. They've got this whole city that they've walled in, but they don't even use it all. And then he has guys building the, the tower that, that Ezra's going to stand on, the little platform there. And I mean, he's, he's all in. Nehemiah knows. He's all in. He says, these people need to hear the word of God. There's power. So it is a powerful thing. It needs to be involved in, in every worship service we do. And our gatherings as well, I, I think probably should involve the, the worship of God. Now, when I say worship, I'm talking about what we do inside the walls here. I mean, like I said, we can use worship in every area of our life. I worship sometimes when I'm driving down the freeway. I'm worshiping. I should be driving, <laughs> but I worship. Don't let my insurance guy hear that. So, uh, I, I'm worshiping as I'm going like, you know, you can worship at work. You can worship at work, thinking of the things that God's doing in your life as you're, as you're spinning the widgets in the factory onto the widget holders, and you're just doing your thing, and you're thinking about the things of God. Maybe you're even singing while you do it, you know, if they'll let you do that. Or, or you're doing something. You're just focusing on the Word of God. Maybe you're memorizing Scripture. There's a lot of ways you can worship when you're by yourself. But, but as a group, as a gathering, as a gathering, we always want to worship God. So that bears, you know, that, that bears some explaining there. Um, what is worship? Well, there's wrong worship. I, I believe that, that to be... The case, if you look at Acts chapter 17, Paul's talking to the men uh, there in, in Athens. He says, For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. God, Paul used that, that crack in their understanding of worship. He used that crack to introduce Christ to them. To say, you don't know who you're worshiping, but let me tell you who you should be worshiping. 
And he used that crack. But, but up to that point, he was, he was talking to people who were worshiping the wrong things. We know lots of people who worship the wrong things, whether it's materialism in our culture or whether it's just a false god or maybe it's something else, but maybe it's themselves, right? Well, I'm, I'll, I'm all in on me. I'll make my own decisions. I'll do my own thing. Maybe that's who they worship, and we know where that leads. So there's that wrong worship, but there's also the fact that God has always called for for order in our worship. One of the things we want to remember is what is worship? Well, it's orderly, for one. It's orderly. Um, What does that mean? Well, it means different things to different people. Our service looks very orderly. In fact, every Sunday, we print up a little little sheet that says, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this. So everybody on the worship team knows, and everybody... But I've been to churches where it's, hey, who's playing today? Hey, what songs are we going to sing? Hey, what would you, I, I tell you what, you do that one song and then I'll get up and preach and then, uh, brother, you come up and pray and then, I mean, they're doing that right in front of the people. A little different way of organizing their worship, right? So there are, there are different ways to do it, but we want to be orderly in, in God's sight in all the things that He commands us to be orderly in. So we want to be as orderly as possible. Maybe we take it Maybe we take it too literally, right? Maybe we could be a little more loose in our worship. Maybe we take that word orderly to mean something that really it doesn't necessarily mean. I think what it means is we put the right things forward to the Lord. And we don't do it in the wrong way. Obviously, we don't worship the wrong things, but when it comes to order, we just put the right things before the Lord. What would it be like if we did our our worship service in reverse, Maybe I just got up and started preaching while there's still people getting coffee out. I didn't start. And maybe do all our music at the end. Heaven forbid we should not have announcements. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Baptist theology 101. You've got to have announcements. Even if there's nothing to announce. Let's announce something. Well, you get my, you get my point. We, we want to be orderly in front of the Lord. We want to include the big things, the orderly things. Hebrews 9 says, now, now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. Isn't that interesting? He's saying, he's the writer of Hebrews there saying, hey, look, this is the deal. Even in the Old Testament, and maybe he was hearkening back to Ezra reading on the, on the platform, right? He said, even they had a way of doing orderly things. Let's do orderly things. And we don't, our, our service doesn't have to look like somebody else's, but let's do orderly things. And let's meet. You know, we, we love to quote as, as Christians, well, don't forsake meeting in the assembly, you know. And, and I believe that. You've got to be here. So for those of you watching on camera, you don't count. That's, that's not true. Um, you want to be here. Even if it's by technology, you want to be here. This is a gathering. But I can worship in my boat, Tom. Yeah, you can. Not, as, not exactly what God intended, but you know, it is possible, I suppose. But who's going to save you when the boat flips over? Here, lots of support. Lots of people. So, so let's, let's do it in an orderly way. And let's, and let's remember, this is a place that God has set aside for us to come and to meet every week. You know, in, the, in the Old Testament, when the shepherds would be out in the fields and they'd be away from home and they'd be far away, they would, they would meet. They would find a spot. And they would find a, a, maybe a mountaintop. They had, you know, if you go out in um, uh, places, uh, I go on my motorcycle where you get way out in the country, and you'll find little rescue spots. Like, you'll be out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, nowhere, nowhere. And you'll find a spot where you can get water, where they've come and drilled, and they've got a water uh, available to you. Or, or I, ones that amaze me is, is the park guys who, who put those um, uh, 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 toilet facility things are just like a, a, a house with a hole kind of a deal and they'll be out in the middle of nowhere and i thought who whose idea was that to put that out here but boy am i thankful he did right and they had places like that all around that are special places and and i think even the even the shepherds had places like that where they'd be out shepherding miles from town but they knew that on that hilltop over there there was a spot where others had worshiped before you could go there that was a good place and you could worship god there and they'd set up a spot and they would worship. Um, I, I've been to men's camps, right? Where it's not church, but it's church. And we get together and we sing and we worship in that place. And, and this is one of those places. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter how new the building is. It's our place to worship. Nehemiah knew that. Ezra knew that. There's a place for our worship. So we don't want to worship the wrong way. We want to worship orderly. 
And we, and we want to make sure that God can accept the type of worship that we're doing. We have to examine what we're doing. In Hebrews, a little bit further in, in chapter 12, it says, Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship. What is acceptable worship? I think he sticks that word in there because simply he wants something that's more than just average. He wants it to be acceptable to God. When you think about doing anything and you ask yourself, well, is this acceptable to God? You're asking yourself, is it a little more than normal? Is it a little better than regular? Um, it, it is acceptable to God. That means it pleases God. It makes Him uh, feel joy as a result of our worship. So, calls us to have orderly worship, worship in a way that he can accept um, our worship. And then God also is constantly seeking worshipers. And that's probably one of the biggest things that you want to take home today is that God is seeking worshipers. In John chapter 4, he says, By, but the hour is coming and is now here. And he was talking a long time ago. So if the hour is here, there, and it's here, here. The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. You ever think about that? That, that God is, He not only wants you to worship Him, but He's seeking you out that you might worship Him. In the darkest moments, when you're having the, the greatest doubts or the most difficult struggles, he might be seeking you out to worship Him. It might be that, that appointment with God, that worship time with Him that turns your life around, that brings you back into communion with Him, that brings you back to a correct understanding. It might just be that. So God is seeking worshipers who will truly worship Him. And then <clears throat> when, I was, when I was looking at this area of, of worship for, of, of God, I, I just... You know, you hit a button, technology, and I look. There's almost 200 times in the New Testament alone that the word worship is used. 200 times. Now, sometimes it's not used in the context we're talking about today, but, but a num worship was a big deal to the early church. It's a big deal to those in the Old Testament. It should be a big deal to us. So that got me going on a little bit of a trail. So I go just to the book of Revelation, and I looked at every mention of the word worship in the book of Revelation. And you know what? When we get to heaven, it doesn't tell us that we have to worship God. And it doesn't tell us, uh, excuse me, it doesn't tell us how we have to worship God. It doesn't say flags. It doesn't say, uh, you know, that, that I've got to do certain things. It, it just assumes I'm going to do it. But it doesn't tell me how. And I, as I as begin to mull that over in my mind, I, I kind of Stumbled onto something. I have to do a little bit more study, but maybe you could do it with me. But I, I realize that when I get to heaven, if, if I know that I'm going to be worshiping God, then what does worship look like there? Uh, if, if I have a good voice, does it mean I sing? You know, if, we're, if we're all perfected, won't we all have good voices? Isn't that what some of us really hope for? Come on. Or you hope for your, your people around you? Man. <laughs> but, but we hope for that, right? So I don't know. Will we all sing? Will we all wave banners? Will we all... I was following the technique of worship in the Old Testament and the New Testament. People raising their hands. Will we all raise our hands in heaven? I know some of you are going, not me. Will, will we all fall on our face in heaven? Will we all get on our knees? Those are some of the descriptions of worship in the New Testament. Um, but as we get to the book of Revelation, it makes no reference to how we should worship. It only tells us to do it. And I find that very interesting. So we want to have worship involved in every every service why is that because number one we're commanded to and number two and, and i think this is really important is this gives you a little bit of insight just a tiny bit because some churches are better at it than others but this gives you a little bit of insight on what heaven's going to be like the gathering of the saints singing of songs the praying to god the the worship of god all going on right here just a just a teeny tiny taste of what heaven is is going to be like don't miss out on that when we come out of doubt and we come to the lord in repentance remember that worship is going to be a part of that you're going to come before the lord in our gatherings and you're going to say lord i i, I want to repent and as a, as i repent i want to become more worshipful 
uh, of you. Um, the reverse, uh, uh, when I, when I um, this is a quote from a woman named Eliza Cook that I wrote down. Um, remorse is the poison of life. Right? You don't want to get to the end of life and go, oh, if I'd only. You don't want to be in your relationship with God and say, oh, if I'd only given more over to God. Uh, remorse is the poison of life, and repentance is the cure. And that's what Israel discovers here. They had ran away from God. They got taken off into slavery, into exile. They come back, and now they remember, oh yeah, God forgive us, and that cured them. Out of that cure comes this great joy, and they're celebrating now, hearing the word of God uh, that Nehemiah had put forward there and worshiping him in, in great joy. And so when we uh, worship, we want to make sure that we worship together and we have great joy. It, it's, it springs forth out of our, uh, really out of our repentance, I think when we come to meet God and we say things like, oh God, I know, I know I didn't do what you wanted me to do. I know I didn't do enough of what you wanted me to do. I know I didn't, you know, we can go down the list of what we didn't do. And God says, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Come on in. What a great sense of joy that we have. Come on in. Worship me. It's okay. And, the, and our joy springs forth from that. Lastly, our gatherings should involve the work of God. And by the work of God, I simply mean look at the last few verses. We've, we've looked uh, at that, that second one, how it should involve worship of God. We, we see in verse uh, 5 and, and uh, verse 6 there. Um, and Ezra blessed the Lord, verse 6, it says, the great God and all the people answered, amen, amen. So he's showing us that worship has got to be a part of our gathering. And then look down at the last couple of verses. If you look at verse 7 and, and verse 8 there in, in the bottom of this uh, passage. And he lists all the names and the Levites, right? And it says it helped the people. They helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So what, he, what he's saying there is all of these leaders, they were like Ezra. They knew the Word of God. They understood the Word of God. They're coming out, and they want to share it with the masses. And so what he's saying is all of these people took people to themselves. And he said, come on, you, you guys right here, you, your first four rows, you, you come with me. And they would stay there, and he would explain to them what Ezra was reading from the Scripture. Now, isn't that an interesting way to do it? Wouldn't it be interesting if I came in here on a Sunday morning, and I began to preach, and then you broke up into small groups? And each small group had an elder or a leader in our church who would say, okay, this is what Tom's trying to say. I don't know if that would work in our setting, because I'm so far afield sometimes, but, but I think it could work. It certainly worked for Ezra and the leaders there. So what we see is, first of all, in verse 7, verse 8, uh, if you look at verse 8, it, they read from the book of the law, from the law of God, clearly. So you always want to involve the Word of God, and you want to read it very clearly. It doesn't have to be difficult, it doesn't have to be hard to understand, just read it very clearly. Then what it says is um, that they gave them, after they read it clearly, they gave them the sense. That's when somebody, one of those tribal leaders, would come up and say, this is what he means. Because you, you got to have that, right? Today in preaching, we call it application. And usually the same guy does it. I've been in churches where, church where guys will get up and preach, and then another pastor will get up and say, this is what he meant. I actually heard it, I thought, well, shouldn't he say what he meant? But, but sometimes it helps to have somebody else come up and say, this is what Tom was saying. Gosh, did you catch that? I thought, that was, that's pretty cool. Maybe we'll incorporate that. Dave's a smart guy. He could do that. And then, so, so they read it clearly. They give a sense, right? They get into small groups and they, they start giving a sense. And by the way, when I read that, I went, oh, this should be the theme verse of our, of our Connect Groups program. Because that's exactly what our groups do. They get together, they look at the Word, they, they get a sense for what it means, right? It's, it's part of what they do in their group, along with all the fellowship and all the other stuff that goes on. So they read it clearly, they give a sense of what it means, and the people, and they did it so, and that's a big word, so the people understood what they were reading. So God's word has to be involved there, and, and our gathering should always involve that type of work because it's the most important work, helping you understand what God's word has to say to you. I, I, I can't, I'm not the best, but there are people here that you can relate to that can do that. Get involved in a small group. Get involved in discipleship. Make, make that happen in your life so that you're getting God's word, you're understanding it clearly. 
Let me pray for us. Father, we look at how to come out of doubt. It is always with this sense of repentance that leads to joy and worship of you. And so, Lord, when we think about that, this, I, I just can't, I can't think of a better picture in Scripture than this one of, of what that turnaround looks like. Coming back to you, just like the exiles did. Giving themselves over to you. Measuring their life according to you and to your word. Giving great uh, sense of awe for who you are. And letting that uh, in, just filter into their life and, and change their perspective. So they could be back in communion with you. And so that's what I pray this morning. God, that if there's somebody here who is not in communion with you, that they would seek you out this very day, that they would say, Lord, I want to be committed to your word in my life. And I want to be committed to worshiping you in everything I do. And Lord, I want to be yours. Help me to understand you. Help me to use the resources of the church or whatever it might be to understand you better. Father, this morning we come with a great sense of the turnaround in that circle. We, we, we've gone through the, the struggles and the doubts. Now, Lord, let us rejoice. Let us repent of all the turning away we did and let us rejoice in all that you have for us. Lord, we love you, and we trust you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got one uh, more worship song. If you would, stand and join us, and we'll sing, and then uh, we'll pray you out. <laughs> there we go. Uh, all right, please stand. <laughs> Four, five, six.
touch on that episode in Nehemiah is that after that point, we know that it happened sometime in the fall because Nehemiah ordered all the people to celebrate the festival of the booths. And that was simply a festival that took place in the fall where people would bring in all their grain. Well, none of them had any grain. They'd all been working on the, on the city. They, they had barely enough to, to eat. But he was recalling what had happened generations before when the Israelites came out of Egypt and they were going through the wilderness. And a booth was simply a house. Imagine if you had to travel cross-country moving every so often. You'd probably have a little plywood house that you could take apart as well, carry along with you. And that was the festival of booths. And so the people were so impacted by what was happening, this rejoicing of coming back to the Lord, repenting and finding this great joy in, in the Lord, that they went back to the festival and they celebrated. Nehemiah said, go, eat, be filled, drink, and have a great time, basically, is the translation. And, and they did. They celebrated what their good God had done. So today, we go from here. Go, have fun, celebrate, enjoy what God has done. But don't forget that when we talk about uh, the God we worship, that it needs to be a, a worship that always involves His Word and always involves the work, and, and, and we should be about Him all the time. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you, you taught this wonderful lesson to the Israelites as they went through uh, coming out of Egypt, but then also the exile and being gone for so long and not being allowed to worship you. And now they are welcoming the opportunity to repent of their, of their distrust of you and their doubt. They're, they're welcoming the chance to celebrate in joy. You got them through a season and they loved you for it. Lord, help us to catch that lesson when we go through that season to depend on you, to allow you to get us through it, and then, of course, to rejoice with you. Lord, we thank you for all that you do in our hearts as people and in the life of the body of our church here. And may we be a, a beacon on a hill that people see that the Lord is at work here, that he gets us through all the seasons, and that we rejoice in that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I expect to see you out front having fun, eating, enjoying each other. Get out of here. <laughs>